Hey there guys, welcome to the special Ruby Moments podcast dubbed before the launch and welcome to the man, the myth, the legend, EC Myers back with us once again. How are you sir? I'm doing very well, hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm fine. So, before the dawn obviously is next week, it launches on the 21st of July, I nearly said June. Are you looking forward to before the dawn and its reactions that it's going to get? Oh, absolutely. Um, it's always really fun to see, for, for a book to go out go out into the world and to see people's reactions to it. Um, I have to say that the, the Ruby books have been different from anything else that I've worked on because there's already an established um, fan base for the, for the series. So I know that people will be reading it. You know, the, the promotional efforts are sort of different from when you have, like, say, my debut novel where you know, nobody knew anything about, about it or about me. Um, and then my next series, um, The Sons of Six, when that came out, I, you know, it was, uh, it was a work for a higher project. So I was involved with the marketing, but the, the, comp the producers of the, of the book, the publishers, were very heavily invested in, in doing more of the marketing. So you know, my first book, I had to do a lot of marketing on my own. The second one, the publisher did a, a bulk of the bulk of it. And then this one, you know, there's there's some marketing involved, but there's also already established uh, people who are going to pick it up, regardless of what I do. You know, regardless of what Scholastic does or how much uh, you know Rooster Teeth promotes it. Um, and then, of course, you hope that you'll you'll reach other people. But it's a little bit of a harder sell for folks who aren't familiar with, uh, you know, Ruby or even after the after the fall. Yeah, I mean, I could honestly say After the Fall is a good jumping on point for people if they want to get into more of like the lore and the setting of Ruby, like Vacuo hasn't been seen in the show yet and making that choice of just setting it in Vacuo does build up the world and that's something I've seen in the early release that I got before the dawn, you definitely expand more on Vacuo, on Shade and setting it up for like when we get to the in the main show and you i can honestly say you've gone from an unknown in the ruby community to one of the bigger known writers for ruby because of the success of after the fall and i do have faith in before the dawn doing either more than vo uh more than after the fall or just on par with volume seven but in your own words how would you sum up before the dawn uh um I guess I would say uh, more hijinks with coffee, plus Team Sun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't give away spoilers sort of thing. Like, we know we're in vacuum, we know we're picking up where Arthur the Fool left off. Yeah, you know, I think that the thing that, that uh, so first of all, I wanted to say, um, you know, it's been, it's been interesting because, like you said, it's like a good jumping off point for, for people to read uh, the books. And it's a really delicate balance because you're sort of you're writing the book, um, the pub you're publishing this book, knowing okay, this is really targeted to people who have seen the show, but you still have to make it accessible to people who maybe haven't seen the show in a while, or, you know, don't remember it, or people who haven't haven't seen it. So you end up with some weird, some somewhat clunky things that I know that that some fans are probably thinking this is a little bit goofy. You know, it's like you put in parentheses, you know, team, you know, CFVY in parentheses coffee. You know, R W R W B Y parentheses Ruby. You know, putting yeah. in those pronunciations or going to great lengths to explain, uh, you know, how our aura works and and what the grim are and things like that. These are really basic things that are known to to most of the people who are going to be reading the books. And yet, you do still hope someone is going to pick up that book who has no idea what the series is and get into it. And so, and so you try to put as much of that like background information in there so that at least they have enough that they can kind of keep going. And to some extent, that's true of the second book as well. There's obviously continuity from after the fall, but you still want it to, to be accessible. I used to read books out of order all the time as a kid. And then you go back and you catch up if you like it. Um, and kids are very, um, you know, young readers are very adaptable. Like they just um, can go with not knowing something, you know, if they get invested in the characters and the, and the plot and the world that they're reading, like they can still just get into it, even though they don't know like half of what's going on, you know? Yeah. And yeah. But, uh, uh, for instance, if you were come like, uh, say like what some, with something, uh, you maybe, yeah. Well, one example, yeah, it's a good idea to really have to help, to get your 
people in to get people invested, even if they're unfamiliar with the material. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What would you say was like the biggest challenge going into Before the Dawn compared to After the Fall? Um, doing writing a better book, or <laughs> writing at least writing at least a book that that you know I think meets the quality of the first one. But then, like sequels are hard. Um, especially books that are in the middle of a series, and I, we don't know if there will be a third book. Possibly, depending on how this book sells, you know, we may be have the opportunity to do do a third book. But uh, yeah, sequels, I sequels certainly, are very difficult. Yeah, if they were to, if they get green light, part, a third, you know, I'm gonna pick it up. Yeah, same here. Because I honestly think, like with a third book, I don't know if you would be allowed to do it or not. But would be to try and tie that book into, say, like volume ten, which is meant to be the vac beginning of the vacuum arc. Would you be interested in doing something like that if they allowed you to tie it all together? Well, I, I think I can say this without spoiling anything. This before the dawn does tie into the the vacuum arc. You know, whenever that comes in the series, at least. Things that that I set up are 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 going to. I, I can't say that they'll be referenced in the show because I haven't seen you know seen the scripts or anything like that. But I do know that right. it, you know I, you, everyone knows that. Gotten around to scripting that far. Right. Everyone knows. Well, they're 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 ahead now. Um, they, I think they they're writing volume, volume, volume nine. nine. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. They're in the process of writing volume nine, and they're at least getting to the point of. And they're working on the voice acting right now. Yeah. So, so I, I do know that at least, like, it, when we say it's canon, it's not just canon in that hopefully it doesn't subvert anything that's been pre-established. Um, you know, although I know people have questions about things that, that, you know, come up in the books. But it's also canon in that it is establishing things that are absolutely going to be seen in the series or at least um, providing background information. I know that could be kind of annoying if, if like, something happens off screen, you know, but the, the, the seasons are so limited, you know, in the number of, of hours that they have to tell a story that if the book can do some of the lifting for the show then then great you know and it won't be yeah. you know i i imagine the the writers are artful enough on, on the series that you know just as i have to kind of catch people up on the books you know if there's something significant from the novel that absolutely needs to be acknowledged in the series for something to make sense then they will find a way to you know relate that on the screen yeah right so yeah. so it's not just so it's not just you know uh you know retcon canon it's also you know can we so we have to be very careful in terms of what we're establishing in the books because it has to line up with where they end up with things that they maybe haven't quite fully worked out yet you know so there's there's there has to be some flexibility as well yeah they don't want the series to subvert to contradict anything that's in the book right that they, that they just said is canon you know and they you could honestly say like miles and kerry would be using your books as reference points as well to help them set up vacua a little bit more because i know one thing from what i've seen in the early release is that you definitely do set up uh headmaster theodore and professor rumple mm -hmm. quite a bit and that's going to be interesting to see if there's any references from them in regards to the events of before the dawn and after the right. fall and I think that was your question, which I was trying to remember what your question was. Like, how did you know? How did I feel going into before the dawn? Or, um, and and that was one of the things where, first of all, I was I was really honored to to be able to introduce such an important character in the book. Like, I never imagined that. Uh, you know, like when I was when I was writing after the fall, of course, I knew okay, some of these things might show up on the show at some point, right? Yeah. But then you know, I wrote I wrote it, and then like Carmen showed up in in. Ruby Amity Arena, and I was like kind of floored, you know, not thinking that the the book was going to have that immediate an impact on the overall like sort of Ruby universe, right? So, mm. and of course, I, I mentioned characters in the book, but it's very easy to kind of throw away a character. Like I mentioned Rumple in um, After the Fall because I needed a character who was part of the school that that Team Coffee had to report to, just like you know, at uh, Beacon. And so I came up with all that. Of course, they approved it. And I was like, oh, they might put this character in the show. They might not. Like, I don't know. But then they yeah. then they then you know one of the things that I think the fans wanted to see that uh, Kruby wanted to see and that I was really excited to show is more of the school life. You know, we didn't get a lot of that in the show. Mm. Um, certainly not after they left Beacon. 
we yeah. I was able to put some of it into After the Fall. Um, that was one of the great things about being able to do those those flashbacks to to Beacon, getting to show a little bit more of the school life, um, and even things like you know here's your class schedule. You know here's some of the other professors. Here are some of the subjects that they're studying. Things to sort of flesh out. This is a school. Like this is a school experience, and we didn't get to spend a lot of time there. Um, and then in Before the Dawn. A good portion of the book is actually set, you know, inside the school proper. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. So there, are a lot of most of their adventures are outside of the school grounds. But school is is a major component of 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 the plot, and uh, has a major impact on the characters and and what they're able to do and and how they have to kind of operate. You know, so it's sort of like you you had in Team Coffee, like they were pretty much out on their own. And a lot yeah. of the adventures in Ruby you have these teams that are out on their own doing things without that much support. But what happens when you're at school, you know, sort of like, uh, I, I really kind of hate to evoke Harry Potter at the, at the moment just because of everything that's going on, <laughs> J.K. Rowling, right. but, but thinking about Harry Potter, you know, the adventures that they had to do while they were still attending classes or while they had professors who were kind of limiting their movements and things like that, you know, school life is very, very much a part of, of what they were able to um, accomplish. So right. it was really neat to kind of get to do that. But um, along with the 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 privilege of getting to establish you know the first look at headmaster theodore and shade academy and some of these areas of vacuo was also the 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 anxiety of doing it right and not just not just for the fans but also like i wanted miles and carrie and eddie and everyone to to like what i was doing and you know, as far as I know, the the way that I've I've described things in the book or how they will be on the show, although of course they can they can depart from that um, if they need to. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, like currently there's been two debates going on in the community that I've seen going around, and one of them I will bring up now is is Theodore based on Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz? You know, I don't want to deal with fan speculation at the moment. Uh, understandable. The other uh, one, you know, and, and you know, as, as with most book, most book, like I think that there's there's a lot in the show that's still open to interpretation. Like you can really only go off of what the um, the the show writers have shared, you know, yeah, publicly before it ends up in the wiki. And I don't think I should be the person to explain like what what the meaning behind the characters are. And things like that if they're still yet to be seen on the show so that's understandable the other one that i have seen is like was there any chance like you got to uh redesign coffee's look or outfits i don't think i don't believe i described their outfits in the in the book um that part of that is that is that personally as a, as a writer i don't tend to describe characters too often um, you know, especially if like there, you, some, something like this, like, you know what they're supposed to look like. Um, and I don't think I'm, I think I, I feel like I, I, I think, I think there might be some reference to, to the uniforms or to the costumes, but to their outfits, but I, I, I don't recall exactly. Um, I, I would, I wouldn't be surprised if they were, if they were reinvented for the show when they return and there's no reason why they couldn't be because some time probably would have passed between, you know, the book and, and when they if they appear on the show yeah because my my mentality around it is you're not really going to see the outfits in like a full spectrum in a book it's rather better to wait until it comes into the show to see the new look because it's a lot easier yeah. you know i think i describe i describe that they 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 have adopted some of the vacuum um sort of clothing and that that could be temporary you know things like putting on um, you know, like a, a cloak or something like that, or a face covering, things like that, which obviously would modify the the look of their outfits. But baseline, like their outfits, probably are pretty much the same. Um, you know, I've seen some really cool. I think I forget. I, I think I'm pronouncing her her tag name. Ali Avian uh, has been sharing some really amazing uh, cartoons on Twitter and Instagram. That she's been doing of uh, of Ruby characters, but then also sp specifically some Team Coffee characters, and she's been illustrating scenes from the book based off of some of the excerpts that I was releasing last month, and they're really great. And she has a really cool redesign for the for the uh, the costumes. Um, you know, I think that looser fitting clothing probably makes a lot more sense. 
yeah. in, uh, in in vacuo. Uh, yeah. Like Sun probably, you know, Sun himself probably, you know, that's just his his look. Um, I could see the rest of the team adapting their outfits a, a little bit. Um, but you know, there's also everybody still has their style, you know. So um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you can still do a lot with what the material, what the the costumes are made out of. Um, you, that you know, they could still look the same, but maybe they're out of more breathable material or, or whatever. Um, but it, you know, the the short version is I didn't delve into that too much because um, you know, even just describing how Theodore looked. I didn't have a lot to go on initially, and I know that they were uh, kind of planning to, to address the look, and then maybe we would kind of make sure that they match up, uh, either by, by me writing it or by them, you know, adapting what I use for the show. But there's also no reason why, again, they can't just, you know, when you see Theodore, he could be wearing something completely different or look completely different from, from how I described him. Yeah, because... Yeah. Uh because a lot of time is going to pass between uh, Before the Dawn and Vacuo when we get to Vacuo in the main show. So there's no reason why he wouldn't want to change. His outfit could get dirty or torn or old. Yeah, and you know, it's yeah. also the thing is, you know, things that, that look okay on the page, at least to me, when you see them in a in a animated form or an illustration, um, they may not work as well. And, you know, I know that, I know some people are hugely, are, are like really big fans of Carmen Esclata's uh, outfit, but I have also seen a lot of people who are like, well, that's really impractical, or that's, you know, um, I didn't have, <laughs> if I had known that that was probably going to be uh, adapted into a character in the game and seen in some visual fashion outside of what, uh, you know, fans were going to create, then I might have described some things differently or, or more clearly or maybe I would have put a little bit more thought into into it, but um, you know, at the moment, I definitely was trying to get something that would get catch Coco's attention, so... Oh, yeah. <laughs> catch it's Coco's one. <laughs> there you go. As long as Coco is happy and sees that outfit and like, hmm, that's a good it. Because I took that when I first saw that as Coco is looking at Carmine. I didn't realize she was looking at the outfit until I went back and had a look at it. It's like, oh, so Coco's not a lesbian yet. But, yeah. But um yeah. how many yeah. how many drafts did Before the Dawn go through? I was gonna ask this with After the Fall as well, but I completely forgot last time. Yeah. Um it went through two two major drafts. Um so that the timing is always very short. Uh, just to meet, meet the production head, uh, the production schedule. I mean, to have a book come out a year after the first book like I was basically, I was, I was still writing it when I was at RTX last year. <laughs> you know, so if you saw me at RTX sitting in, you know, uh, one of the cafes or a hallway or something on my laptop, I was probably working on the book. Um, <laughs> and uh, so yeah, it's a very tight schedule. Um, so, but we did a lot more work in the. I'd say we did a lot of work. Uh, preliminary work in the outlining phase so you hope that you, n you nail things down well enough in the outline so that you know that the overall plot's going to work um, like the, how does the story flow, how does the character arc you know, balance out, things like that uh, try to work out the logistics of what's going on and the sense of like okay what characters do you need and um, how is everything going to come together you do all that in the outline and I used to not like outlining you know, um, writing my own my own books, I would generally just try to be you know quote organic about it and just like I'm just gonna I have a vague idea of where I'm going. And I'm just gonna write it. But when you're on a tight schedule and you have a lot of people involved with making sure that the story is going to work, you know, for for what you're trying to do, um, you really need to have a strong outline so that everyone can kind of get an, a, a pretty good idea of where it's gonna go. And then in that in that sense, if you're in a tight schedule. Um, it helped me tremendously because you know I didn't have to sit sit down and say, all right, well I've got I've got an hour to write. Like, what am I going to write? It's like I sat down and said, okay, I'm writing that scene now, and I could just kind of get into it and and go. So all of that um, had been done ahead of time. So I wrote a first draft of it, um, and then I sent it to my editor, and she had some feedback, and um, she made some some edits herself. She's a very um, hands on like she was she was a very hands on editor. Um, you know, so so in some cases, so in a um, traditional 
if I were writing a traditional book, like it was, it was something that was original to me and I shared it with the editor, they would send me revision notes and probably not make any edits. They might make some, some line edits, things like that, or they might make some suggestions. But uh, my editor was, was very f comfortable with just changing lines because if she made a recommendation and sent it back to me to approve it, I would generally approve it unless it was something that was like, you know, something I really disagreed with and wanted to have a discussion about. Um, but so she would generally just make whatever changes she needed to make and then send it on to Rooster Teeth. And then they would make some notes. They might make re request some changes and then send it back. She would kind of process all of it, trying to try to uh, com condense all of the feedback into you know one document or a couple of documents because I'd be getting feedback from multiple people on the team, and we have to kind of reconcile everything. And then I would get it all back, and then I would have to then revise that. So I did another draft of uh, re revision, um, and a bunch of things changed. I had to add some things. Um, it's one of the reasons why, you know, I think, I think when we talked last, I had said, you know, all of uh, everyone in Team Sun had a had a POV chapter, and I thought that was true, but then as I was doing the excerpts, I realized I had actually lied to you because Sage unfortunately does not have a POV chapter, but I thought that he had a section, a POV section, which either I planned to write and didn't, or it got removed at some point. But, and we can go into the details of like why that happens and why Sage is on the outs, because I know some folks are probably <laughs> upset about that. But, um, but there, sometimes it's hard to keep all of that in my head because the book, the, the, the drafts will change. There's like multiple outlines and then there's multiple drafts. And, um, you know, sometimes I just don't remember <laughs> what ended up in the final book. So I did another well, revision. So I did that revision. I sent it back and my editor made some other edits. And I think sometimes they come back with me with some specific questions, but then, you know, Rooster Teeth will have some feedback. And then depending on where we are in the process, whatever Rooster Teeth needs to be in the manuscript will just end up in there. And I may not necessarily get final approval, you know? Yeah. Cause I had it noted underneath it about what happened with Sage and you, <laughs> so if you want to go into that more than welcome, because I'm curious about that. <laughs> yep. Sorry. One second. I have a little visitor here. No worries, mate. <laughs> Sounds like someone's banging a hammer in the background somewhere. <laughs> Can you hear the echo? <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. that that's okay. You me you mentioned about Sage not having a POV chapter, and I did have it noted as a question of what happened to Sage, because I wasn't sure if you'd be able to say <laughs> or not. <laughs> so What happened to Sage? <laughs> yeah. Buy, buy Before the Dawn, and then hopefully we'll get to do a third book. And and we can make Sage the main <laughs> character. Um, so 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 the challenge is when you're so if you look at the book when you read the book, there are like nine or ten POV characters, which is a lot for a book. Yeah. And besides that, there are a lot of other characters who are on screen. Um, we had to we had to scale some things back. I had to conflate some characters. Uh, there's just a, there were just a lot of characters to balance. And in in thinking about how to how to plot it out, thinking about uh, you, the, the the best flow for it, you know, for each chapter, I had to think about which character made the most sense to advance to advance the plot and or the, the, the character building. So obviously in this book, most of the focus, I think most of the character arc is focused on, I think, Sun um, and his dealings with his team. Uh, but then you also have Team Coffee and, and, and Coco's learning some things and, and Velvet's learning some things um, and Yatahashi is learning some things. So so those those characters made the most sense to kind of focus the bulk of the story on and then there are other things like there's like you know i think i think unfortunately fox has only one pov chapter um he's really hard to write and it didn't make sense to have him be a pov character for multiple for multiple chapters but i couldn't not have fox in there because he's so much fun to write and i think that the fans you know like him liked him in after the fall as well so yeah. You know, and so it also comes down to a matter of okay, I'm writing Team Sun, and Sun and Neptune are better established characters because you've seen them on screen more, right? Yeah. 
Um, Scarlet uh -huh. was really important to have his POV in here because he plays into the, di the dynamic of Sun um, and also sort of the theme of like learning how to be, be a leader, right? Mm -hmm. So so I had to, so that's why I had more Scarlet representation in the book, I guess. And Sage is like an enigma uh -huh. to a lot of people. And, you know, it takes time for me to come up with, okay, well, I have to come up with this backstory. I have to figure out like, you know, and, and even just things like, okay, is this okay to be his semblance or is this okay to be his, uh, you know, his weapon? And that back and forth takes time. And, you know, I think that, you know, given, given if there had been a third draft, I think that, that Sage probably would have had, you know, more, more screen time. Yeah. But it was a really tight, it was a really tight schedule. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so, um, you know, I'm very, I'm very sad that I wasn't able to do more with him, but, you know, I, I think I've, I've, I've pointed out that even in the first book, you know, and after the fall, uh, Velvet didn't really have a backstory. And my reasoning for that primarily was Velvet was the character we knew the best, at least from the, from the show. We knew more about her than anyone else in Team Coffee. Um, she had more screen time than anyone else in Team Coffee. And I thought that she needed the least kind of development, um, you know, and she was already getting a lot of screen time anyway in the, in the book, you know, again, one reason being, we, you know, I knew more about her. Um, mm -hmm. So at least I was able to do more with her in, in Before the Dawn. So Before the Dawn was sort of, some of it was, it was a checklist of things that I didn't get to do in the first book that I wanted to do more of, you know. Uh, I can just picture you having like that little checklist on uh, next to your laptop and you've got everything written on there and certain things are either highlighted or marked that you can't really do because <laughs> it's spoilers. Like what happened with Coco's semblance, you had to rework it and change it because it's coming in the show apparently. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah, and that's allowed at least allowed us to get an explanation for for something from volume two. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I mean, was there anything else from the other drafts that had to be cut or was missed out that you really wanted to have in the final draft? Besides Sage, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> there are certainly there's certain lines that I really liked that uh, were changed or 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 we had to lose them. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything in particular. You know, some of the things that that don't make it in are just things that um, you know when you get into the revision they don't they don't really fit anymore with with the direction that you're moving the, the story in. Um, you know, I'm actually looking. I have I have some of my notes like with me. Um, which this would be fun for folks to see at some point, I think. Um, yeah. so I'm holding on to these things because I've got I've got them all, you know, I've got them all marked up. But like, um, <laughs> you know, like one note I have on here that I think I can sh I can share is like so things that I had to think about as I'm writing this. You know, I have like a note in the margin of my out one of my the third draft of this outline that says, his son seen Velvet fight, where were they at the, at the fall of Beacon? And so I knew that they, you know, I had to just go back and double check. I was like, okay, they were there, like when she's fighting the Paladins. So I was able to then, you know, I, he knows how her semblance works and her, um, and Anesidora, like her weapon. So, you know, I had, to, I had to keep in mind things like what knowledge do each of the characters have about each other? Um, and I most often would, would rely on things that we had seen on screen, but then, yeah, of course, you know, sometimes things happen off screen. I know sometimes, I know some folks are, uh, like, oh, so team coffee and team Ruby were like best friends or, or whatever. And, you know, some of it's like extrapolation to the things that you don't see on screen. And as long you know, in, in my book, as long as it's not, I guess, literally in my book, as long as it doesn't contradict anything that you saw on the show, like it's, it's, it's fair game. Oh. Yeah. That's a good <laughs> philosophy to go with. Yeah, definitely. But Before the Dawn isn't the only book you got coming out this year. This year is going to be a busy year for you because we've also got the long-awaited Fairy Tales of Remnant coming as well, which is done yes. by yourself, which I believe is going to add a lot more lore to Ruby as well, if I'm correct, with these I fairies. Think it, adds, it, definitely, it definitely adds some lore, and some lore might be, might be hidden in there that is maybe less obvious. Um... <laughs> And there was some lore that I wasn't allowed to <laughs> that I wasn't allowed to add, but oh my god, I'm right. so excited that I know this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know something that you can't tell us. That's going to be I, the biggest I'll, tease. I also say that you know that that happened very um, that that project came about, and I was actually uh, revising before the dawn while I was writing 
Fairy Tales of Remnant, the first draft. And so that's also like, I was very busy for a very short, for a small period of time. I was extremely busy. Um, <laughs> and that one was exciting because I, I couldn't tell anybody what I was working on. Like if I'm like, if I, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty open on, on social media, you know, letting people know, okay, I'm, work, I'm writing today or whatever. Here's my deadline. I turned in this project or whatever, but that project nobody right. knew that I was working on. So, and I didn't mm. want to spoil it, of course. Um, and actually, I probably was also contractually probably obligated not to not to divulge that I was working on it. But right. uh, but that was really it was really fun. But it was also very very stressful. I had a lot of very late nights. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, I mean, I still I have a day job, and as you know, I have a of a, a a young child, and it, you know, I don't have as much writing time as I used to, and so. I just got to make it work whenever I can. So I just don't get, don't get a lot of sleep. I hold up at, uh, I don't know if you, you have a Panera, but we had, I was hold up at Panera for many weekends, just drinking coffee, you know, and like this book was very much fueled by coffee because I just had to get away. And so, you know, my wife was a real, real champion and took over some of the childcare on the weekends so that I could get away. Um, but I have to leave my house. I had to leave my house to mm. get a lot of it done because I would be writing for, you know, 10 or 12 hours. And my son, as you know, doesn't necessarily respect that I have other things that, that I have to get done. So Major kudos to your wife for helping you out with that then. Because without her, we would yeah. have all the exciting <laughs> stuff. <laughs> well, and you know, the, yeah. these are, some of these things are, are things that, you know, uh, somebody will, will approach me with a project or, or something. And like, realistically, I should say no. I should say I would love to do that. But I don't see how I can possibly do that. And yet there are opportunities that I cannot say no to. And, um, you know, I think uh, the Fairy Tales of Remnant was, was definitely one of them. Yeah, it's like your coffee mug is the relic of temptation. It's bringing the project to you and you're very tempted by it because it's like a one shot opportunity. <laughs> You know, I, I sometimes yeah. say that, so, you know, since since my son was born and, you know, I have a, a job and everything, I've been less, um, I've been less productive with, with writing than, than I had been in the past, um, you know, so I just kind of like slowed down a little bit and, uh, and I seemed fine with that. And then when suddenly I started getting a bunch of projects and some of them were overlapping with each other, like I started working on a serial for Serial Box publishing and then I got the Ruby book and then I was given another serial to work on with, with serial box. Um, and I couldn't say that was orphan black and I couldn't say no to that. Um, you know, getting to work on two like really fantastic franchises, you know, shows that I love, um, and knowing that I won't have that chance again, it was like, I'm going to do it. I'm figure out how to make it work, you know, generally sacrificing sleep and weekends and, you know, free time and, and things like that. Um, and I've been, yeah. I feel like I've been lucky because I, I, I would generally say, okay, well, I, I'm wrapping this project up. I don't really have any, any big deadlines coming up, but usually around that time, something else will come along and, you know, I'll be, you know, I'll be available for it. And just like the other day, um, I was approached on another project, not Ruby related. Um, so it was kind of, it kind of held true again. Cause it was like, oh, I don't really have anything going on right now. I've got this story, a short story for this anthology that, um, hasn't been announced yet that I'm just wrapping up actually today. And uh, I was like, I don't really have anything to work on. I guess I should probably get back to you know one of my novels that that has been lying fallow for for a bit. Um, and then I got an email from an editor saying, Hey, we're going to do this thing. Do you want do you want to be part of it? I'm like, Yeah, I'll do it. And then then I start thinking, Oh no, that means I'm going to have more deadlines and I have to work and you know. Oh, <laughs> but uh, you know, certainly I think a lot of people, um, a lot of creators in during the pandemic are finding it very difficult to work. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I've always generally find uh, you know a deadline is incredibly motivating, especially one for which you've signed a contract and expect payment. So for the most part, you know I, I just get it done. You know I may I may wait until the last minute, but I'll get it done. <laughs> <laughs> so with After the Fall, Before the Dawn, and even Fairy Tales of Remnant, did you have any like notes given to you by Miles and Carrie that were done by the man himself, Monty Ohm, to work from or? Was it all from Miles and Carrie? Well, you know, not not directly, not as such, but they do have a sort of a story bible 
Um, so they've got things where they have they have worked out, you know, the rules of how the Grim operate and just you know Aura and it, just, it covers things just ma- like how is it capitalized, you know, but how does it work as well? And so so I had those as well, but I also had access to to Eddie, who's you know who was their lore master. I guess he continues to be their lore master even as he writes for the show, um, and so. You know, I was always able to run things by him, so he was basically a sort of like the rock, the walking uh, database. So in that sense, those are things that had been developed by or with Monty, and you know we want to continue that and, and respect it, of course. <laughs> um, you know, it's that's just another huge, huge part of you know the the honor that I have to contribute to this to this this world. It's like you know just getting to play in somebody else's uh, playground, and so definitely having a sense of wanting to do right by his memory and, and the work that he created and then also the expectations of the fans and um, you know you when you you know you're also in a situation where I'm also in a situation where I'm writing for other writers and there's like some element of like I don't want them to think that I suck you know because <laughs> I love you know I love I love the work that Miles and Carrie and now Eddie and Kirstie have been doing on the show and you know, sending the, sending other writers your work if they're not in your critique group is extremely, extremely oh. stressful. Can be extremely <laughs> stressful. You know, but they've yeah. always been really they've also always been really great. And I also felt felt like they understand, you know, how a, how a story evolves. You know, because I would turn in a first draft and like, okay, I know that things aren't perfect yet, or I have a lot of questions, or um, you know, this hasn't quite worked out yet. But they must go through the same creative process that I do. And they always, you know, you always know that the end product is going to be better than, you know, where you start. And yeah. some of that comes about through the collaboration with, with yeah. the other writers um, and your editors and things like that. So I had to just kind of, you know, um, not not be too hung up on too, too hung up on that, um, like not worrying about it being perfect because, you know, they trusted me with this this project because they thought that I could handle it. And um, I have to believe that too, you know. Yeah. Speaking of like Eddie being the law master, I've got images of Eddie being the gender bent version of Jin inside the Relic of Knowledge for Rooster Teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I I have not seen that. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> that could become his official title at Rooster Teeth. He is the Jin of Rooster Teeth. <laughs> I hope they. Can. And when he does a uh, when he does the the next uh, Ask Me Anything, he should you can ask me three questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that could honestly work, and it'd be like you can only ask me three questions that are not associated with Ruby. <laughs> yeah, like I liked he did a he did a little thread recently where he was he was saying you can ask me questions, but I'm going to pretend that um, you know we're answering questions about Volume Seven, you know, which was kind of a fun fun thing to do. Um, kind of a mad, you know, what? How would he have answered things? You know, now that people know how things turned out, like what would his answer have been? Some of those questions. Yeah, kind of neat. I do have one more question before we jump into the fan questions. Do you have like an idea of the timeline, like between Volume Three into After the Fall, going into Before the Dawn? How much time has passed? Yeah, so I th- I think I know I have it worked out on paper, and I know we we talked about it um, when we were planning planning After the Fall. So After the Fall is, I believe, um, I would say eight months to a year after. The fall of Beacon. They were at Beacon for a little while. It took them a little time to get to Vacuo, um, and then they were there for for a little bit before the story started. Um, but before the dawn is pretty soon after after the fall. Like it follows, I'd say probably within a couple of weeks. I think or a few weeks. Ah. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, because I know like the events going from like Volume Three through Volume Four, going into Volume Five, is like six to eight months over that entire two volumes for all well, those arcs. Sort of, yeah, and I had to work out the timing of of Sun getting to Team Sun getting to Vacuo. Um, so obviously, you know, the end of after the fall after the fall is concurrent with uh, Volume Six with Six. six. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it takes them some time to get to get from Mistral to to Vacuo. Like I know they took a train because they were at the station, but I think yeah, at a certain point they just kind of had to 
had to walk, you know. Um, yeah, no, so, at least uh, it wasn't like Team Ranger where they basically walked all the way from from Ruby's home at Hatch to to uh to Kuro Yuri Yuri Kuro Yuri, and then mm. they had to get on and uh, then got an airship to back to Mistral. Them to, yeah, and I think I because actually tried to work Ruby out. Ruby thought it would only take uh, like two, three weeks tops. Mm. I think I actually tried and to work they out ended up the, on the uh... road for months. <laughs> <laughs> I did actually Maybe. try to work out the timing of uh, like where the train would take them to and what they might transfer to, and then where where they would need to stop. And I feel like I feel like I I I I, I budgeted in like a few months for them to actually get to Vacuo from Mistral thinking about the timing of, of Sun's arrival. Um, and then, of course, at the beginning of Before the Dawn, like, Team Sun hasn't been there for very long at all. Um, right. They're still kind of settling in, and, uh, you know, that's kind of part of part of the uh, part of the struggles that they're having there. <laughs> yeah, because the, I think the one thing that we still don't have in Ruby is, like, the year. I know, like, we have dates and months that are similar to us, but we don't have the year in Ruby, and the time frame is, like, as confusing and as mysterious as like the death tool from the Battle of Beacon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, people are people are really curious about you know characters' ages and and um, you know and I think because you know how old is Coco and you know I would just basically go off of you know they were second years in in Beacon they're basically third years at Vacuo, um, but they've been there for a while so they I think. I think they're like seniors. I think they're seniors by the time they're in Before the Dawn. Oh. Um, yeah, okay. So then you think about like the age, like, most of the characters, like Ruby's obviously an exception, but most of the characters, so they were like, what, 18, 19? I think, yeah. <laughs> I, I think everyone except yeah. Ruby and Oscar on the main heroes team is 19 as of volume seven. That's right. the presumed age. We know Ruby is 17 because she was 15 when Beacon started. So two years, give or take. Right. So, but we do have 35 qu fan questions. These guys clearly, obviously, wanted to get in on this because yep. <laughs> I made the announcement about you're coming on again. Fan questions are open again. And it was just like a flood of questions for the first two days. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I've never seen so many people happy to get a chance to ask someone from Kruby like yourself. I do consider you as part of Kruby because you have written for Ruby. But yeah, we do have... 35 questions to get through within an hour and 15 minutes left of our recording. So let's see how well we do. Our, yep. our first question is from T Trenton Dixon. What was the fun slash challenging parts of writing for Team Sun and Team Coffee? What was the most challenging part of writing Team Sun and Team Coffee? Yeah, what was the fun and challenging parts of writing for... Oh, for Team Sun versus Team Coffee. Okay, uh, the fun part was definitely getting to uh, make up their their backstories and their their dynamics a little bit more, um, especially for Team Coffee, where you hadn't you hadn't seen seen you know two of the members of the team very much. I guess that's true of Team Sun as well. Um, so that was definitely one of the fun aspects because I also had the most freedom with that, um, especially in terms of coming up with you know their their semblances. Um, that was also one of the most challenging parts, especially for Team Sun, because uh, Team Sun, you know, I uh, so Sun was already established, but with, with like Neptune, I was like, well, I don't want to come up with something that like Carrie doesn't like, you know, <laughs> um, and but I didn't get a, I didn't get a huge amount of, of direction, I'd, so so I you know kind of was able to um, I had to kind of extrapolate with what they'd given me and come up with something that, that I thought worked and then they kind of had to give it their blessing. And so it was really fun to be able to, to do that. Um, and then the challenging, another challenging aspect of it is, um, especially with uh, with the characters that you'd seen on the screen, just making sure that I got their characters right. You know, they yeah. had already been established. I know I know, folks are, are, are concerned about um, how Sun comes off and the excerpts that they've seen, and I, I hope that people will just kind of give it a chance and, and understand that um, you, they're seeing like two percent of the whole book, and right. that's not necessarily indicative. And and even so, like there, 
you know, people have built up so much about these characters in their heads already. They have their own head canons. They've written fan fictions. Um, yeah. They just, you know, they um, they they also have like tremendously strong attachments to the characters, strong feelings about about them, and um, you know how they think that they would act or react in certain situations. And so, you know, I just kind of had to, had to do my own thing while trying to be faithful to at least the, the character that I see him as in, in the show and what makes the most sense in the story of, of, of the book. Um, so that was, that was definitely a challenge too, just wanting to get the characters, get the characters right. Like, you know, being able to write Fox and Yato Hashi, who, you know, pretty much nothing about. Like Fox, I had the most freedom with. Um, and I think that he, he ended up surprising a lot of people because they didn't have much to go on and yet they still had an idea of like what he would be like and he was nothing like what anyone thought he would be like. Um, ah. Yeah, so so uh. it's, it's been, it's, both, it's, it's kind of that, that um, double-edged sword of like the, the fun and the challenge are kind of caught up together where, you know, I get to play around but I also still need to make sure that it's, it's something that fits with the show um yeah. and fortunately you know i have you know i'm a fan of the show too like I, I watch it and and i have my own my own expectations of it um but then i also at least had you know uh, miles and carrie and, and eddie there to to kind of be like double check everything and just give everything its blessing and ask the right questions and make the right suggestions and steer me you know if, or flat out tell me to do something you know if, if it was necessary Ah, so our second question is from my good friend Jay, who the last time round you mentioned about bringing Penny back, you piqued his interest about that, <laughs> and he's asked, he has asked how you were planning to bring Penny back in After the Fall before you were told about her coming back in Volume 7. It was really something that my editor and I just kind of tossed out there, is like, we, there's a scene... It's actually, this is that, oh, okay, that's actually something that's really cool that I wasn't able to do in the book. Um, I wrote, I actually wrote some scenes with characters that people would know in the book that I was really excited about, and we ended up taking them out, partially because there were so many characters, um, right. and partially because they didn't quite fit. It, it, it was probably felt, lent more, leaned more on the side of fan service than, than anything else, and... Uh, so that was kind of sad to, to lose that. But related to that, there is a scene where there is a a a fight with a, someone who shows up, and it was, it was and, and we wanted the character who showed up to be a real shock, like somebody that that none of the characters would have been expecting to appear um, in that setting in vacuo, or you know, um, and then it would also just be something for the fans to really to really enjoy. And one of the suggestions that we threw out there was that could it be could it be a salvaged penny, you know, from uh, uh, from Amity Arena? Um, and they, of course, now I can say they said no because they were planning to bring Penny back already, which had me very excited because I knew that before she appeared on the show. Um, so I was like, okay, yeah. well that's great. Like I, I'm bummed that I can't we can't use her, but I'm really psyched that she's coming back, and that's really cool that you're doing that. <laughs> Excuse me, and of course it makes a lot of sense that you know they would have been able to salvage her from from Amity Arena. And in fact, they have Amity Arena, so yeah. Um, so that was so I can't. I don't want to tell you who those characters were that I was going to bring back um, because if there's a third book, we might have the opportunity again. Ah, but, now you've got my interest peaked uh, again. <laughs> but. Uh. Um, but uh, I had I wrote it was a really fun scene. It was a really fun, it was a really fun. There were some really fun interactions with Neptune in that scene. I, I, I'll tell you that much. Um, <laughs> and I had to I had to lose it. But uh, yeah, yeah. I maybe can... one day maybe one day I can reveal that. <laughs> yeah, I can honestly say I would have faith in you if you were given the opportunity to have a project put in front of you. That's okay. We're going to do a Penny prequel story before she ends up in Beacon. I think that would be a nice little story for her, and I would have faith in you actually doing that. If no, Roos yeah. <laughs> if Rooster Teeth ever came round to <laughs> doing prequels before Volume One, a Penny one would go down well with fans because people love Penny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Penny Penny's pretty great. I'm I'm eyeing that poster. I don't know if you've seen the um, 
they were doing this uh, sort of anime crossover line of, of t-shirts and posters, and they have a poster with a penny on it that's evocative of uh, the Castle in the Sky poster uh, in oh. the Studio Ghibli movie. Um, yeah. And uh, and it looks really it looks really cool, and I do like pennies, so I may have to I may have to splurge for that one. But um, <laughs> but yeah. yeah, you know, it's, the, in thinking about even the next book, it was like, well, do we want to do a follow up to uh, after the fall, or do we want to do something else? And so we toss some ideas out out there, and some of them are things that you know rightfully should be reserved for the show. Um, so there are some stories that people want to see that I'm pretty sure are going to be on the show at some point, or, or at least animated in some way. Um, and yeah, I mean, yeah, so, so yeah, so I didn't have the opportunity to write those, and it made sense to continue the story from the first book, especially since it wasn't really a cliffhanger, but we set, certainly set up a mystery. Um, and the and the the the, the tone of, of Before the Dawn is is pretty different, I think, from. Uh, after the fall where I think that before the dawn really is a little bit more of a mystery of like what's happening and there's obviously action and there's stuff going on but it's a lot more um, just kind of I think grounded a little bit more in uh, the characters you know doing things and talking to people and uh, figuring things out than it is like fighting you know I mean I guess yeah. there, was a, there was a mystery in after the fall as well but it was yeah. a little bit less obviously a mystery you know <laughs> Yeah, like uh, why the why all the emotion bombs are happening. Yeah, and hopefully, you know, the way that that, that I was writing was like, okay, well, this is something that people are sort of tangentially aware is happening, or at least they're starting to pick up on something weird going on. Some some readers might pick up on it sooner than others, but there's also just more immediate things that they have to react to, and you know as opposed to in before the dawn people already know okay something weird is happening there's there's an operator out there somebody is you know uh hunting down people with with strong semblances but then also a lot of other people are missing from vacuo and nobody's doing anything about it and they don't all have have powerful semblances so what gives like wh where are these people going like what's happening and that the way that people invest in that uh, that mystery and that 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 mission um, reflects on their characters, and it's, it's something that they have to kind of kind of deal with in the in the story. Ah. Mm -hmm. So our third question comes from Ram. I hope I'm pronouncing that name right. Are there any criticisms regarding the first book that you have taken to heart and worked to improve in the second book, such as Carmine and Bertilak's portrayal not having much of an impact due to their lack of interaction with Team Coffee? Hmm. Well, I think that's actually the first time I've heard that criticism, and it and it and it hurts. Um, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, I, you know, I was, I'm sort of aware of. of some of the some of the some of the criticism, but I don't necessarily take a lot of it to heart. There's some some criticism you you hear and you're just like, okay, well that's you know your your perspective on it, um, or you don't understand like why that was done a certain way. Um, in terms of things that are actually actionable and, and stuff that I can I can fix, I don't I don't think I took anything like that to heart. And some of it might have been that I didn't I didn't. I just wasn't thinking about it while I was writing the next book. I was just concentrating on writing the next book and hopefully not too caught up in how people had received the first one. Um, but I do see the criticism, you know, I, I didn't see that one, but I do see the criticism out there. Um, and uh, some of it, I won't say is more legitimate than others, but there are definitely people who are kind of prepared to just kind of hate everything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. And I can certainly take that with a grain of salt. Um you know, it's 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 uh, you know once the book is is out there, like it it has to stand on its own, you know. And I I've been doing this long enough that I I don't think I tend to take criticism too too personally. Yeah, um, right. yeah. I think you know, we've... that's one of the first things you have to learn as a writer. I think kind of distancing yourself from the from the work a little bit and understanding that you know it's, it's something that you write isn't going to be for for everyone. Um, and there's always going to be something you can do better. And so I, I'm not going to get stuck on. You know, like, oh, I wish I'd done this differently. Um, the only, oh, you know, the only thing that I that I'm I'm sad about the 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 typos with uh, Coco's last name, and that's part of that's on me because I just was inconsistent in how I was writing it. But then, you know, part of it is like it just wasn't caught, you know, in, in proofreading. 
Yeah. And uh, and it and it's it makes me sad. I, I Cyprus yeah. makes me sad. And um, so I think I tried harder to make sure that her name was spelled correctly in in the next book for sure. So that's that's one one thing that I was I was trying harder. <laughs> I was trying harder in the second book. <laughs> uh- our fourth question, I think you had an interaction with one of these uh, members from Ruby Nation before. I believe it was Ublek, if I remember correctly. But we have a question from Sona, who is Glinda Goodwitch on Ruby Nation. Uh, she has asked, if you have to choose a voice actor- actress to voice Carmine, who would it be and why? Um, I'm not sure that I'm up on, on voice actors enough to, to, to be able to, to say, um, I, my first answer would probably be my wife because she really wants to do, do a voice on, on uh, Ruby at some point. Um, <laughs> but I would also want it to, to just be somebody who, uh, was a person of color, you know, that would more closely match, uh, much the way that carbon was described in the in the book so in that sense i wouldn't i wouldn't want it to be my wife yeah. um yeah. you know i don't i don't i'm not i'm not as good with voice actors as i used to be uh when i was a kid like i would be able to say oh that's the same voice actor who played you know donatello and teenage Ninja turtles and he's doing this other role in this other cartoon and you know i recognize voices but i don't necessarily recognize a lot of a lot of the names um so i don't really have anyone in particular in mm. mind. I mean, if I was going to pick a if I was going to pick a voice actress, I would honestly uh, pick. Uh, got background noise, Leaf. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. But yeah, I would honestly pick Laura Bailey. Laura Bailey was in Volume Three as Amber, and I would honestly like to give her another yeah. crack at the whip, so to speak. Or, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think. Maybe Tara Strong. Who does the Harley Quinn voice oh, yeah. a lot? Yeah, she's really yeah, good. Yeah, since yeah, starting with Batman Arkham City. Yeah, she's really good. <laughs> I do I do know her uh, her work. Um, oh, you just reminded me of another scene. It was, it was something related to Carmen that I had to take out of the. <laughs> it was really. It was just. Like a, it was just kind of like a line. Um, Care to share? Uh, it'll come back one day, maybe. <laughs> I was gonna say, can't to share? <laughs> no, I can't. There's too much caught up in that scene. I'd have to explain like all the things that led up to that that point, just to explain like the, the joke. Well, um, <laughs> oh, that's a bit of a shame. But if we have you on again sometime this year or next year, I'll make sure to remember that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yep. <laughs> But we have three questions. I, f- I believe that this person is an imposter because the guy's name is Unloading Leaf. Yeah, that Leaf. Is, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> but he's he's asked. I know Leaf can't see the form either, so he's most likely forgotten his questions. But I've got them here. Yeah, he's. I can go <laughs> well, uh, Leaf. Well, first off, have you played Grim Eclipse? And if so, what did you think of it? Oh. Um, I actually have played Grim Eclipse. Um, I'm still not very good at it, but I, I actually streamed it last year. Uh, I think on when after the fall um, launched, um, just to just for like a little while. And I've been playing it since then. I've been playing it with a friend of mine online, um, and I actually quite like it. It's uh, I, I don't tend to play a lot of games like that. Like I'm still more like a, of a retro gamer, so I, I play a lot of like old school, you know, eight bit platformers and things like that. So I'm not necessarily I'm not necessarily um, that comfortable with games that require like a lot of controls and, and things like that. But the game is really approachable. Like I think it's uh, like even actually, so my son started playing it. I was playing the other night actually with a, uh, with my friend online and my son saw me playing it. He's, he's five. And so he really wanted to play. I was like, I don't know if you're going to, if you're going to be able to handle this, there's like a lot of controls and I'm not sure you're going to like this, but you know, at some point I handed him the controller a couple days later and uh, he was able to, to last pretty well. I just told him like, as soon as you hear, the crackling sound of like your aura being depleted, like run because you have to recharge. Yeah, <laughs> uh, he was play- he was playing with my 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 character, one of my characters, like one of my, my, my I have Ruby built up to like level eight or nine, which um, so she wasn't she wasn't completely uh, vulnerable. Um, so it's fun, it's fun. I like you know the the voice work in it and the story is really interesting. I had to actually seen the script before I played the game just because it was part of the sort of the canon that I was able to um, familiar, familiarize myself with before I, I started writing after the fall. Um, and 
and actually, and actually, Grim Eclipse was helpful in helping me visualize some of the some of the dust mines, which I will say appear in uh, Before the Dawn. So, so that was kind of that was kind of neat. Um, yeah, I think it's fun. I haven't I haven't quite finished it yet because I haven't haven't had a lot of t- time to play with my friend. But uh, we're working our way through the through the campaign. And uh, of course, I would I, I, like I bought all the when when the DLC was on sale, I bought all the different costumes and everything. So I have like the time skip and the pajamas and the dance party <laughs> outfits and things like that for all the characters. But of course, I would love it if Team Coffee was in it. Um, oh yeah, you know, and I would love to play it with someone from from Team Kruby. You know, <laughs> I thought that would have been a fun that would have been a fun kind of promotional thing to do at some point. But uh, everyone's yeah. busy. Imagine, so. imagine like after the forum before the dawn gets adapted into a game by someone like Rocksteady <laughs> Studios in the Unreal Engine, and then you get invited onto Achievement Hunter to play it with Achievement Hunter. <laughs> oh, yeah. hey, hey i i would take it like i know i see i saw like aaron was playing it recently um which is kind of cool and i know that the, the the ruby voice actors had played had played it once you know back when the game first came out um yeah, i mean hey yeah. i'd settle for i'd settle for someone from from team coffee being added to uh you know blast blue cross tag battle or something like that um, uh, which i'm really terrible at i'm deeply terrible at that game i finally picked it up and uh, i don't think i've gotten neo yet i haven't gotten the, the dlc yet but um it's really cool yeah. seeing those characters um you know fighting you know they're, they're perfect like ruby's a perfect fighting game like just do a ruby fighting game just all the characters you make it a, make it a uh you know uh uh, vital festival thing, an alternate universe vital festival or something, and just just make that the game. Like do a fighting game with all the characters would be super cool. Or have you be yeah. able to customize your customize your own character like you can like Smash Brothers or something like that. Ooh, um, nice. How exciting would that be if people could kind of take their fan fiction characters and recreate them, you know, with certain set set of semblances in the game? That would be super cool. Yeah. And maybe throw in letting us make our own custom weapons. Right? Yeah. Can you imagine like the modding the modding uh, aspect of that? Oh uh, yeah. Maybe one maybe yeah. one day. That would be that would be a lot of fun. Maybe. Oh yeah. <laughs> you got your other two questions, Leaf, or do you want me to yeah. uh, another now second question would be have you read the the DC comics? Guys, I haven't, but I did recently pre-order the trade paperback. I have not read the comics yet. Um, partially, partially, I was I was pretty busy writing Ruby when they were when the, as most of them were coming out. Um, but I also just was planning to pick up like the trade. Is that out yet? Uh, it out? It'll be out next month, according to Amazon. Yeah, yeah, I'll I'll have to pick that up. But you know, um, I've got the 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 manga. Um, I try to I try to read. I certainly try to read anything you know anything that's like canon. And I and even though that the the DC comics are mostly canon, they're not necessarily immediately relevant to you know what I've been writing. So I just haven't gotten around to them yet. Uh huh. <laughs> you got one more question, Leaf. Yeah. Uh, this one uh, I can't quite recall. So go. Last time we tossed around ideas for other expanded universe books. Any other All ideas right. you think you'd be interested in doing? I'm All sorry. Right. Say that. Say that again. Last uh, time. <laughs> last time we tossed around some expanded universe book ideas. Mm-hmm. Any others you got in mind? Uh, I haven't really thought about it uh, since. Um, you know, it's still. Definitely be interested in doing a, a Neo and Torchwick Torchwick book. Um, you know, it could be interesting at some point to do something that's in universe that's totally totally separate from anything you've seen on the screen. Um, you know, as opposed to doing a prequel or a, another side story. Um, you know, it's something that they do a lot in uh, in Star Trek. You know, I mean, there's been so many Star Trek books over the. the past many decades you know they've got whole crews ships and and crews that are original to the books you know that have their own series and uh and that could be an interesting that could be an interesting thing um and you know there's always you know there's there could always be a volume two of of the fairy tales of of remnant 
Um, Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> but, uh, but like, and I'm not saying that's anything anyone's even remotely discussed, but you, you could, there are so many fairy tales that you could tell or so many stories you could tell. I think it would be interesting yeah. to do a, 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 a collection of stories that maybe, um, you could do a collection that has like maybe four stories that are each about four different sets of characters or something from the series. Um, that way, cause then you could, there, there might be some of those stories are interesting, but may not be enough to, to, to carry their own novel, you know? Um, so it would be interesting to see some of those, but that would probably be better to have like multiple writers doing that sort of a thing. And so in that sense, I wouldn't mind like maybe writing, you know, one of the stories that was in the collection like that. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like yeah. a fun idea. You could easily make a Ruby anthology and have, like, fans get involved with it and work within the canon under yourself with your guidance and that. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> so, it's <they're> worth it. <laughs> well, with, with some of the community, it'd be like teaching primary school kids, in my opinion. <laughs> That's what it would feel like. <laughs> but... Our next question comes from Bolt Indy. Which villains in Ruby do you think have the most charm? Which villains in Ruby have the most charm? Yeah. Ah, oh, interesting. Um, definitely, Arthur's very interesting. Um, well, in Salem, I mean, Salem is really... I mean, to to I mean, she she obviously can can scare a lot of people to working into working for her, but she's she's drawn together a really interesting uh, team. Um, so definitely definitely Salem and and, and Arthur, um, and obviously I mean Torchwick <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, and I don't know. We'll have to see have to see where where i would falls right <laughs> yeah right now he's really going downhill in terms of his sanity <laughs> yeah which is why i'm i'm a bit grateful that we've actually got someone like theo because from what i've seen with theo in before the dawn he is completely different to what we've seen with the other three he is for lack of a better word in my opinion the cool uncle of the academies <laughs> yeah <laughs> but our next you know it's it's really it's really cool to have the, the the benefit and again you know being able to establish this character um you know hopefully hopefully uh i, I mean i imagine that that the the miles and carrie and, and eddie all all liked it there are definitely there are different aspects of his character so the i think i mentioned last time there you know i live for those comments where people are where where they say something like you know they you know they like laugh out loud or just comment on on something being really awesome and i definitely got some of those notes on on theo so that was really cool and so again like sort of establishing the, the character to to a great extent you know, I had some some guidance, but I had to actually write the dialogue and think about how he's going to how he's going to act and how he's going to interact with the 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 uh, the students. And like, you haven't seen anything yet. I specifically did not share any excerpts of Theo in the in um, last month when I was doing those when I was tweeting those uh, those out because I really wanted. Yeah, I feel I feel bad enough that people are going to discover him in, in my book and not on the show. But I felt like I definitely wanted people to discover him in the book and not in a tweet. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. so you haven't seen anything yet. I would say I would have to say Theo was a lot of fun to write. Probably since I didn't get to write much of Fox uh, this time around, at least from his POV, um, I was I had a lot of fun getting to write write Theo, and I really hope people people like him and. I, I'm 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 dying to see him on screen. <laughs> yeah, he he's yeah. designing that is a case of when I was reading it and I had saw the word cape, I just had Edna from The Incredibles in my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, being all no capes. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, I mean he's definitely he's definitely a bit of a showman, you know. <laughs> As I say, the cool uncle. <laughs> but <laughs> our next question comes from Sergeant Chrysalis. And I think that might be an MLP reference in the name, but <laughs> what would I know about that? But when <laughs> when you started writing After the Fall or Before the Dawn, did you have a... Oh, my phone just switched off one second. Did you have a general idea for the plot's resolution in mind? For instance, was Team Coffee always going to end up helping the villagers reach the Sandslider? 
uh, and then face off against the villains in the sandstorm, or did you, or did you more have a few rough points you knew you want needed or wanted to hit and let the plot develop more as you achieved those scenes? That was uh, a bit. <laughs> um, they were they were absolutely in the outline, at least the the, the final outline before I started you know writing the book. Um, like I said, we had to have a complete outline uh, worked out ahead of time so that everyone could um, agree that that was where we wanted the, the story to go. Um, so, you know, obviously when I sat down to write the outline, I didn't necessarily know that that's where things were going. Um, but, um, I mean, the villagers, helping the villagers was definitely something that I had in mind from the beginning. Like, cause that's where the idea really, really came from, that the villagers had to keep, had to keep moving. Um, and the Grim were following them. And um, as for the the giant turtle, I don't I don't know I don't I don't remember you know again I don't remember exactly when it was like oh they should evacuate on the on the turtle. But uh, you know once I, you once you come up with the idea of like okay you can have a big a big turtle like it probably just made the most sense to to send them there. Um, I mean I was thinking about things that that were had a pretty strong like visual impact that were really cool. Um, and uh yeah so i mean it's certainly you know when i was outlining it I, it just it came to me at some point like they're trying to describe the creative process like how did i come up with that idea is, it can be really challenging and i'm not even sure necessarily that, that was in the first outline i'd have to double check um but uh certainly by the time i start, sat down to write the book like that was there and i really did not stray from the outline much at all in in the actual writing um if i did it might have been to change it might have been to change like a POV character or something like that, or there were certain things in the outline that I hadn't quite worked out yet. Like I may not have known like character names. The character names changed um, a little bit in After the Fall. Um, you know, before I got to Carmen and Bertilak, I had some other names for them, and uh, you know, because it was like I needed to give them a name for the outline. And then once I actually sat down and started researching and thinking about what I wanted their names to be, and had to kind of match the whole naming uh, system in Ruby. Um, you know, so that, that stuff changed. So there's certain things that I just saved until I was, I was writing, you know, the actual book later on. And then I kind of filled them in. Um, and usually I would, I would send back a, I would send back a report with the, with the manuscript and say, okay, here are all the characters that, especially like before the dawn has a ton of characters and, and many of them are new. Um, here are the characters that I came up with and like what their semblances do if, if they're, if they're relevant and like what their names mean <laughs> like, is this okay because they had to kind of approve that it made sense in the in the in the system for the for the show yeah so we do have a uh where are we i lost my place uh we, our next question is from tess are there any restrictions you find challenging to work with we were just talking about the naming conventions. I I actually find that really hard, um, just because yeah, <laughs> you know, just thinking about it. Uh, try to yeah, that you know, is uh, in what talkative of a color. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really challenging, especially um, you know when you're thinking of team names. You know, so it was it was it was very challenging in in before the dawn to figure out, okay, here are the characters that I have and here are the possible combinations of characters based on their names and here are the possible names that their teams could be spelling and thinking, you know, thinking about all those things and trying to balance it all with, you know, what made sense for the plot and, you know, still be consistent with the naming system. And yet, you know, I mentioned to the, to the, to the, to the writers, you know, that I found that really hard and they said that they, they had a lot of fun with that part. And I think that the, the difference is, like they get to sit in a room together, tossing out names to each other, figuring out you know, until they come up with the name that they like, um, and just like spending that time. And and when I'm doing it, I'm sitting there by myself, and I'm wasting time—not wasting time, but I'm using up time, you know, going down the the internet rabbit hole of researching color names and fairy tales and mythologies and things like that, trying to come up with something that sounds really cool that also fits their naming convention, you know? Um, so it's a different, I think it's a different uh, experience in terms of coming up with, with those names. And actually they probably the entire process because they have their, their writer's room. Like I was able to, to sit in on the writer's room for after the fall. And we had some conference calls uh, while I was working on before the dawn 
Um, but for the most part, you know, once I have that outline, I'm sitting there doing doing it all by myself, and then you know, sending it back in. And we may or may not do a follow up call, or may just get notes back, you know, depending on what's going on. But they were all very busy um, working on volume uh, seven you know, while I was working on the book. And so they were not as, as probably accessible as, as I think they were when, it, when I was doing after the fall. Ah. So, so you had to basically find the names on your own, which I'll admit, trying to get you know, the CNR. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I could say, you know, I'm, I'm not going to offload the workings, but you tell me what their names should be, you know, and that actually is a fun, that can be a fun part of the process. It's just a difficult one. And one that, um, you know, it doesn't come easily to me. Like they've also been doing it a lot longer than I have. Probably any fan fiction writer um, out there um, who's been writing stories for a while has like their own system, and they they kind of know this. And certainly, when I was writing after the fall, I was like learning the system, and I was very uncertain, certain, uncertain with it um, at at first. And then, and before the dawn, I think I was a little bit more comfortable with it. But I also now had so many more characters to name that it was really it was a real challenge. Um, you know, but thinking of even just like coming up with like names of the weapons and, you know, uh, with Team Coffee, like that was that was a lot of fun. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's 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 a challenge because the and, the and honestly, part of the challenge is just knowing that, OK, well, whatever I write, like that's that's canon. Like if once they approve it, that's that's it like people are, are it's gonna end up in the wiki right so yeah, yeah. The, the good old guys on the wiki yeah, they're always looking for things to add to the wiki yeah. and i will admit like it's even more of a harder challenge with the cnr when you've got about 400 plus ocs made just for one series <laughs> because i've had mm -hmm. to personally do that myself <laughs> but it is a hard part but yeah <laughs> we... yeah and i think i saw like people were already updating the wiki with like information they'd gleaned from my tweets and like that was that was 240 characters <laughs> you're just you're just slapping that up on the wiki and you know i mean I, I hope that people like what they saw i saw lots of different reactions to it but um again just hold hold off you know so, certain things can seem out of character if you're only seeing one moment in time and that moment in time is like one sentence you know um that fits within the overall characters arc you know in the story so yeah so our next per friendly person that sent a question in is james we got two questions from him are we getting uh team sun semblances aside from suns revealed i know we talked about sage ain't gonna get a pov so there's no <laughs> there's no chance sorry, for sage. sage sorry sage fans <laughs> but for like neptune and scarlet i'm assuming we are going to get like uh semblance reveals for them yeah, you get you get Neptune's pretty overtly, and you get um, Scarlet's kind of in context. Uh, so we'll have to wait until the third book to fully confirm Scarlet's. Then I think, unless you know, if someone at Rooster Teeth wants to make it up and share it ahead of time, and and if there is a third book, they'd be doing me a favor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the Ruby Companion was helpful. Like I didn't have to come up. I, actually, I came up with names for um, some of the weapons and things that you know. But then the Ruby Companion came out, so they had worked out some of that that information ahead of time. So I was able to to rely on that. Um, yeah, I think uh, the Companion, unfortunately, wasn't available when I was writing after the fall. Although some of the after the fall stuff made it into into the book before it went to to print too, I guess. Which is also really cool. Like when I saw like that, uh, you know, their um, some of the information about Team Coffee was in there. That was really exciting. Yeah. His uh, second question is: I think this is going to be a bit of a fun one for you. Favorite character in Before the Dawn to write for? Ah. Uh. Um, definitely Theodore, and I mean I still love Fox. He's he's in there. He's in there less, but uh, he's definitely there. And uh, and uh, Neptune. Neptune was actually a lot of fun to write write as well. Uh, I guess I guess when you start looking at the characters, because I'll say I'll say I'll say Theodore's a little bit. He can be a little bit immature at times. I, I clearly seem to like writing the, the goofier <laughs> characters a little bit more. Um, I like doing sort of some of the comic relief stuff, um, and that's maybe why that may be one of the reasons why 
I got the gig in the first place. Like the scenes that I wrote, the scene that I wrote uh, to audition was from Ruby's POV. So I was able to kind of channel some of Ruby's Ruby's uh, wackiness into that. Um, so yeah, I'd say I'd say Theo and Neptune and, and Fox were the most fun to write. The, the good trio. <laughs> Uh, this question that's next, it comes from Master Play, and I honestly had a laughing fit over it, because it's one of those random questions that is just out of the blue, and that is, does Star Sazang have better abs than Sun? <laughs> <laughs> that is an awesome question. Um, I would say she definitely has nipples, but... <laughs> Um, <laughs> although I guess that hasn't really been established in the show's canon, has it? But anyway, um, I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say she could totally kick Sun's ass. <laughs> she's a lot fitter and a lot more... <laughs> well, Sun has the six-pack. She's got, what, like an eight or a ten? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if we'll see her on the show. We'll have to see what they what they do with her. Yeah, I could honestly see Star sparring with Yang in Vacuo. She's probably the thing is she's probably a little bit more modest than Sun is, so uh, the anti Sun. You wouldn't, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know <laughs> until it was too late, probably. <laughs> ah. Our next question comes from Adrian Jamillo. That sounds like a Ruby name to me. I like that. But Adrian <laughs> yeah. asks, was there any difficulty to write slash develop any of the characters when writing the two books? like personality, goals, or relationships? Hmm. Any difficulty? Personality, goals, or relationships? Um, like I said, I think that the real challenge was just like making sure that the characters um, sounded like themselves. And Sun, Sun had, has had a lot more lines than anyone on Team Coffee um, anyone else on Team Sun, and so I had more to go on with him, um, and so I had to. I, I worked really hard to make sure that that he sounds like Sun, you know. Yeah. Um, and whether people whether people believe that he's acting like Sun is another story, but you know they'll decide when they read the book, um, or maybe you've already decided. But uh, that was that was definitely more of a challenge in, in a sense because he was more much more established i had less kind of wiggle room with with uh sun you know at the same time i was able to kind of get more into his head yeah um, than you really get on the show like on the show it's very he's very surface level sun is very very open though you know at least with at least with people who aren't on his his own team you know so um and that that's you know that could just be a macho thing right like that could just be he's just but he generally will say whatever he's thinking right yeah and um uh, and so it was. It was. It was definitely. It was. A, it was a challenge because I. I had to. I, he. He has a lot of screen time in, in the book. Uh, he's pretty much. You know. He. And, he and Coco. I think take take front stage both on the cover and, and I think in the story. Um, but uh, you know, I had to. I had to kind of get into his head a lot more, and uh, and that was that was difficult. And it, you know, you. To, to be able to write like a character arc, like a character changing in the context of, of the book, like coffee, the character development, like you didn't know anything about the character except what you saw on the, sh on the show. And so I kind of had, you know, okay, well, this is what this character is like here, you know, at the beginning and here's where they're going to end up. Um, and here's what they were like before we even see them, you know, in the flashbacks. Um, son, son is like, okay, well, we know what he's like, or we think we know what he's like. And so, how did he get that way and how is he going to change because of the events of, of this, this story, you know, how, mm. how, how is he going to affect the story and how does the story affect him? And I will, I will say that, um, son has a really major impact in, in the outcome of, of, of the book. So if anybody's worried about that, like he is, he's really, he's really important. Yeah, he does. I can honestly say he does get like, um, What's the word? Growth. Because in the show, we only see what uh, what the show shows us. But Before mm -hmm. the Dawn definitely takes Sun, as well as like Neptune as well, and expands those characters even more and makes them more, less 
less two-dimensional and makes them more three-dimensional. So there's more layers like an onion to these characters that we've only seen a little of, and we can just yeah. peel them back. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I feel like I could say, like, I keep forgetting that you've read the book. I feel like I'd say that Sun has always been, he's kind of comes off as like a sidekick, right? Yeah. It's like, he's like around, he, he does stuff and he helps. He's support. He's a support character. And, um, and that's not really great for a leader. Right. Yeah. Um, and so some of his, some of his growth in this story is him, you know, taking action, I think. And that's, that's what you want for your main, one of your main characters. And it's one of the reasons like, and being able to develop that is one of the reasons why you don't get that much time with Sage. Like, Sage doesn't have that much to 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 do in this book um, in terms of personal personal growth, so you know he doesn't necessarily warrant a POV chapter. You know, um, <laughs> again, yeah. sorry, and Sage. Just, like I keep thinking about the scene. So when you see like that scene where where Sun and Neptune are sitting like eating ramen or something, and they're like, "You think they're okay?" Like yeah, I'm sure they're fine. Like. That's funny. It's really funny, but it's not very satisfying for a character to abandon, the, you know, friends in need in like a really stressful situation, right? Yeah. It's it's really funny. It's really funny, and I love that moment. <laughs> but it's also like, so he has to. So that's Sun. That's where Sun starts, you know, in this book. And where does he end up? Like, what would he still do that by the end of Before the Dawn? You know? Yeah. <laughs> So it's a, there's quite a bit of like development for Sun, and I really think that if Kruby does sort of take inspiration from Before the Dawn, we're going to see a very different Sun when we get back to Vacuo in the main show. But our next, yeah, I keep trying to think. Like I'm very interested in how how things are going to turn out in in the show. You know how much of of the books are going to come into the show because I know like they're going to vacuo. So you'll see you'll see the setting. You'll see vacuo. You'll see Theodore. You'll see shade. Um, I don't know for sure they're going to see coffee and sun. You know probably there are lots of reasons why you will or won't. Um, it was really exciting to see you know Team Funky and Atlas. Um, even even briefly, you know, and so they could very well be relegated to like a cameo like that, and that would still be really cool. Um, I like I don't imagine there'll be major players um, in the plot just because you already have a lot of major players. Like the show right now is doing the same thing I had to do in Before the Dawn, where they have so many team members, um, you know, working together um, to uh, you know stop Salem, and how do you give them all the uh, n- enough time? You know, and you have to make decisions. Okay, well, this is still probably primarily Ruby's story, so you're going to spend most of your time with her um, from her perspective and with her character development. That doesn't mean the other characters don't get to develop um, and and change. You know, you had a few moments with Ren and Nora, um, and I think everyone had like a moment in the last volume. Uh, like you got to see where's John at right now, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But you can't give them whole episodes anymore because you've got such a short window of, of uh, you've got so little time to work with and you have to move the plot along. And, uh, you know, and, it's, you know, it's a, it's a similar challenge, I think, in, in Before the Dawn where I had, you know, basically the same, you know, it's like people have kind of called Sun like Juniper to Coffee being Ruby. And, uh, you know, in some, in some ways that makes sense. Um, so it's tough it's a tough it's a tough it's a balancing act and you're never going to be able to satisfy everyone because there's going to be that person who really wanted to see sage and they were going to read the book and they're going to throw it across the room and be like not enough sage um and i'm sorry like you know uh, i hope we have the <laughs> hope we have the opportunity to do more to do more with them um but uh yeah yeah but our next question comes from yang gang <laughs> who? <laughs> Some of these names. Yeah, I was drinking my coffee. I was yeah. drinking coffee when you said that. <laughs> <I'm a joke. laughs> who was the <laughs> easiest character to write for, and whom was the hardest? I think we covered who was the hardest. I believe. I'm not too sure. Yeah, yeah I think. Uh, I think. Um, I was going to say Fox, but Fox is kind of challenging. I mean, humor is hard. 
Um, yeah, humor can be really hard, and even though I love those moments, and, and I think that I hopefully hopefully they work pretty well, um, he can be really challenging. It's really challenging. I was actually really glad to not have to do more than one POV character POV scene from chapter from his perspective because uh, it's really hard to write when your character can't see can't see things, and it's an interesting challenge. And I think that it's an, an you know it's a it's a good. Um, uh, it's the good change. He notices different things, and he has a different, literal, literally a different perspective on things from everyone else. Um, but it's also really hard, you know, uh, for me as a writer who tends to default to describing things visually to yeah. not do that. Um, I kind of would say probably the easiest to write was uh, was uh, Coco. I mean, Coco's pretty pretty defined, I think, at this point. Yeah. And I think she does she does grow, and I think she changes a bit, um, but she's pretty. She's pretty locked in, and so I, I I had a stronger sense of like who she is and what she and what she is. Velvet still had a lot of development, I think, to go through in in Before the Dawn, um, and so Velvet used to be I think the easiest character because I knew more about her at least starting out with After the Fall. But um, thinking about where she is now, for, you know, following After the Fall, and uh, she still is she you know she was at a pretty good place at and after the fall but she still has stuff that she's figuring out about herself and, and learning and the, the really cool thing with velvet was I got to show her doing more stuff um, uh, more than just you know fighting more than just her semblance and um, especially like her back her backstory a bit that was really that was really cool to do that um, so yeah I'd say I'd say Coco is probably probably the easiest just because uh, She's Coco. <laughs> Coco is Coco, and that's that. Yeah. Uh, I'm pairing these next two questions together because they're technically the same, and they're both one's from J H J L H, and the other is from Di Diana Rose. What got you into writing? What got me into writing? Um, well, actually, was was interested in writing when I was really when I was really young. I mean, growing up, I was always a, a, a very avid reader and probably the first time I started writing something I was I was I was 13 I think I was I was really I was really into books I was like oh, how hard could it be to write a, a, a science fiction novel um, so I started writing a science fiction novel and you know I was 13 and it wasn't any good but I was a good enough reader at that point to realize that it wasn't any good and so I stopped um, and then I tried a couple more times over the years. Like I tried writing some spec scripts for Star Trek because you used to be able to send in scripts, um, unsolicited scripts. So I wrote a few of those and sent them in uh, to Paramount, which was so that was like the first thing I actually wrote and then submitted. And uh, I was just always really good at writing, you know, as a kid, even creative creative writing. But uh, actually, formal attempts at writing wasn't until college. Uh, once I realized that I didn't want to become a doctor, I wanted to get into the creative industry. Uh, I wanted to get into television and film, uh, either editing or production or writing. And I auditioned for, or I, I applied for the uh, Nickelodeon. Nickelodeon had a fellowship program, and so you had to write a, a, a spec script. And so uh, I wrote a spec script for the show called Cat Dog. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Oh, yeah, Cat Dog. Oh, yeah. yeah, so I wrote, so to be completely on brand, uh, I wrote a, a story called Static Quo, which was about uh, Cat Dog discovering that their uh, his clothing, like the dryers and the laundromat, were actually portals to a parallel dimension, and so he gets sucked through that, and that's where all the socks go, of course. Um, so he was sucked through that, and he met Dog Cat, and <laughs> so there was, you know, parallel universe, like mirror mirror type of stuff going on there. And I did not get into that yeah. fellowship, but. Um, that didn't stop me from writing. I, I didn't get to do the fellowship, but I, I decided, okay, well, I really want to write. And, um, you know, if I wanted to write screenplays, I'd have to move to like LA probably, you know, and I didn't really want to do that. Um, so I started writing short fiction because I could send that to magazines like science fiction and fantasy magazines. And I could live anywhere and just do that, you know, on my own time. And if I got published, it was just because the story was good. So I did that for a while. And that was really, that was the, the, the thing that stuck. You know, I was doing short, I was writing short stories for a while. I wasn't selling anything. Um, and then I went to a workshop called Clarion West in 2005, which is a, it's an intensive uh, six week writing workshop where you're there with uh, 17 other students. And uh, each week you have a different instructor who is a, a well-known, author or editor 
and uh, you just you critique, you write a new story every week, and you're critiquing like up you know around three stories a day, and it was kind of like a boot camp for writers, and I really improved a lot over the course of that time. And once I came out of that workshop, I actually started selling short stories. And then I started working on my novel and eventually I got an agent, sold a novel. So that's really kind of like the 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 uh, progression of, of how I got into writing as, you know, being published, I guess. <laughs> Very long and uh, interesting journey for a legend. <laughs> <laughs> or a myth. Yeah. <laughs> But uh, our next question comes from Stephen Victor. What was the approach to Sun and his backstory and interactions with his team and Team Coffee? Um, well, so a lot of a lot of uh, the approach is thinking about what each of the characters think of, of each other, right? So going into Sun, so and I know a lot of people just from the excerpts that I've shown have been like, oh, he's you know. He doesn't like. They think that I don't like Team Sun, or that I'm bashing Sun, and I actually do like Team Sun. I love Sun and Neptune. Like they're fantastic characters, and so I felt I felt bad that people were getting that impression. But the things that they were seeing were from like Coco's perspective. Coco absolutely would think that Sun was a total loser, right? Mm. <laughs> uh-huh. She would, and you know, even even based off of their performance in. in in uh, the Vital Festival, like sure, you know, Coco and Yatsu were were taken out. Um, I mean, they were taken out by Salem's uh, operatives, but you know, nobody knew that at the time. But even the way that C- Team Sun won, like it was kind of a fluke. Like they did not do well. They were not a cohesive unit when they were fighting. They were lucky, and possibly, you know, like their opponent, like Team Indi- was it Team Indigo? Yeah. They were not that good either, like you know. So, you know, it's it's just based off of what you know. And of course, Coco's very judgmental, you know, um, and so she's going to be pretty clear about how she, what she thinks about about Team Sun. But you know, on the con- to conversely, like Sun sees Team Coffee like a bunch of hot shots. You know, um, they came from outside of Beacon, and of course, they had their own reputation there. But, uh, you know, Sun's not necessarily going to be impressed by, like, another team being, like, awesome or thinking that they're awesome. And so you have those things. Like, I, I really wanted, because of the, the character arc, it's Sun learning learning to be a better leader. And whether he can learn that from Coco or not, Coco still is working some of that out herself. But she's definitely grown since, you know, she started. Um, then butting heads, you know. And then you've got Sun butting heads with his own team so it's really it's really sun against everyone um <laughs> except uh, except you know in a lot of ways velvet like he and velvet at least have like a little bit of a connection um you know and they're both fondness like they understand things a little bit differently they have a different perspective from it from most of the other the other um characters um but but it really is like sun against against everyone and and you know even though he's he's kind of has has this habit of you know following people and helping helping people and being he's also just done things on his own he's like very brash you know and he's got to deal with that so, yeah, so that's really I, yeah you know so so that isolating son and uh, he tends to ditch his team at a drop at the drop of a hat yeah you know it's like maybe he tells them you know because you never really know in the show at least like did he tell them he was going where he was going like. Um, are they, and even if they say it's fine, like, are they really fine? It's like, you know, sometimes somebody will ask you to do something. You're like, yeah, that's fine. You know, it's because that's, you're not willing to take, have that fight at that moment. Right. Or yeah. just, you're used to it. You, you know, you're used to their behavior and you're just, you just accept it. Um, but, uh, so it's really, it's about son being isolated, both in his interactions with other people and by his own, right. his own actions, you know, and, and that might be hard for some people. Uh, to deal with, but uh, I hope it. I hope it makes sense, and I hope it it, it makes sense once you read the book. And, right. Uh, <laughs> you know, and it's not that I hate Sun. Mm. You know, no. you need uh, the context. People, people kind of often attribute the author's um, beliefs uh, with like things that come out in their books. And obviously, there's some influence. Um, there has to be, but. You know, if I write, you know, Velvet hates the sand, right? She hates sand. 
I don't, <laughs> I don't mind sand. Like, you know, like I love yeah. going to the beach. It, it's kind of annoying in some ways, but I don't, I don't hate sand, you know. Um, but in coming up with characters, you think about things that, that, you know, that they, they have to like things and dislike things and you have to sell it, you know, from their, from their perspective. Yeah. I mean, uh, the next question we have, I think, is one that I think you're going to enjoy, and that's from that Star Wars kid. Who do you think is the perfect casting choice for Fox? Oh, wow. Well, like I said, I don't know about the, I don't know about the voice actors, but, um, oh, man, I don't know. I It's got to be somebody really funny. <laughs> I'm trying to think about what's the is it Ben Schwartz who did the voice of Sonic and uh, I think he's like Dewey or something on the new DuckTales show like somebody like that like I don't know if they're gonna they'd get Ben Schwartz for that but it has to be somebody who just like just the sound of their voice will make you laugh so you know? so someone that's basically the male version of Barbara Dunkelman yeah okay I'll go with that <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah I was just thinking maybe Nolan North okay yeah yeah mm -hmm. if you if you've ever played any of the uncharted games you'd pr probably know yeah somebody who's just yeah. really really like sarcastic and and just just <laughs> goofy <laughs> yeah i mean we got two next questions that are asking about any hints for our headmaster theodore and i believe we've already covered theodore in the non-spoilery way and it's yeah. like is there any more you could tell for Theodore, or is I really want to see. I, so I know I know certain things. Um, you know, I, I know enough to, to to describe him for the book, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how he's how he appears on the show. And I think uh, I think that I don't want to comment too much because I don't know what's going to change before it gets to the show. Um, and I do think that. You know, while it's really, really exciting that people get to discover him in the book, I think, I think it's only really they're really only going to discover him when they see when they see the show. So, I, right. uh, I think I should reserve some of some of the commentary. Um, <laughs> I yeah, mean, the for next the heavy, for the, the the bigger guns. Yeah, I mean, the next question that I've got, I've marked it down as you might be able to answer. And it's from Kyle, who's asking, are we going to possibly see any human faunus families? Human fa You mean like a mixed family? Yeah, where you got one uh, human parent, one faunus parent. In, in Before the Dawn. Yeah, in Before the Dawn. I don't think I... I wouldn't... I can't say that they, that they aren't there, but I didn't explicitly call any anyone out i don't think yeah because i don't think i described, I don't think I described um any any like mixed family um overtly or anything like that well that's one thing that uh, hasn't been seen in the show yet and hopefully they will cover it down the line i am i do think like i'm hoping i see it in before the dawn as i'm going down whether velvet's parents are both like faunus or whether they're both one's human one's mm. female that's one interesting thing around that. Uh, I think that Star Wars kid put another one in, but he's put his name as STSWK. So I think he's trying to deceive me or trick me. <laughs> <laughs> because I know it's... Oh, we didn't really get 35 questions from 35 people. We got 35 questions from like five people. Yeah, because I I know, I know the Star Wars kid, he absolutely loves the Cinnabon ship of Velvet and Yatsu. And he's asking... Mm. He's asking, was pairing Velvet and Yatsuhashi together a choice for you, or did you have free control over that? Did I pair Yatsu and and, uh, and Velvet? Yeah, together, like partners. Uh, that Say, for example, like you got uh, uh, Yang and Blake that work closely okay, together. Okay, not, not romantically. Yeah, not romantic. <laughs> not okay. getting into shipping. <laughs> okay. Um, I believe I, that I did that based off of the... Um, the naming conventions, uh, which I believe because so Ruby, Ruby and Weiss are a pair and then uh, Blake and Yang are a pair. So coffee, Coco and Fox, I paired them and 
Yatsu and Velvet, I, I paired them. Ah. So uh, I, I feel like I feel I I could be wrong, but I feel like that was that was explained to me as part of the naming convention. But I, I might be wrong on that, I, or, or I might be misremembering. I, I, I probably have notes somewhere. I've got notes everywhere for for some of these things. And uh, once I actually write it, I I forget, <laughs> I forget about a lot of the stuff. If you ask me, like I have like a cheat sheet of all the characters in there, like what their names mean, but like. I don't remember anymore. <laughs> so, like, so when people start talking about some of the characters who show up in the in the book, they're gonna, you know, I'll have to double check my own notes to be sure of like what the if it's not obvious, I'll have to double check to make sure like what the reference was for some of them. <laughs> you can always send me the cheat sheet because I know the wiki are gonna need it for the uh, the OCs uh, and that. So I've got a, I've got a, a for a for a writer, I have a really crappy memory, but um, honestly. You know, it, this happens all the time where even for like my day job, like I'll write something or I'll edit something. And then as soon as it's done, like I just forget about it because I don't need to know about it anymore. You know, <laughs> so. Uh, so <laughs> next... Someone will say, oh, you remember that thing you wrote like three weeks ago? I'm like, I have no clue what you're talking about. I, I'm sure <laughs> I have I have it on my computer. Like, let me look for it. I've, I've, I've got it. But oh, yeah, now I remember what that is. But like offhand, especially because people ask you something and like, they they know something from a different name or they'll ask about a different from a different topic and that's not necessarily how i'm thinking of, of whatever it is so it takes a little while for us to realize we're talking about the same thing yeah i thought i originally thought this name was called shube do but i realized i missed out the hyphen behind it after shube <laughs> so <laughs> shube is asking do you have any inspiration you'd like to name in particular that you used in before the dawn hmm I think in um, I think in Before the Dawn, I used some more like Roman mythology. Ah, that helps. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> some of the characters. I do some like of the and things like that. Yeah, it's nice to see that different sorts of mythologies are being used in other media. Yeah, and you know, that's like, you know, the, the fairy tales have been pretty well pretty well mined and, you know, my my perspective on it was and this, you know, it's it's canon now, but my perspective on it is, you know, um, for instance, you know, using Arthurian legends for um, for after the fall. Um, those are just other kinds of fairy tales, you know, in a sense. And yeah. of course, you know, the series also draws on children's literature and things like that. And I, I drew on children's literature as well for um, some of Before the Dawn. Like specifically, I think they tend to use that more for like the professors. So when I was coming up with some of the professors' names, I was drawing more on, on some of those types of stories. Um, but, you know, just I tend to like want to extrapolate because the fairy tales have been very, you know, they would give me... It was interesting. Like they gave me a list of, of characters that I wasn't able to use, like fairy tales I wasn't able to use um, for before the dawn, and after for, and after the fall, I think. And like one of them was like you can't use um, like the crocodile from uh, you know Peter Pan. You know, obviously. so now in retrospect, it's like obvious why some of these characters you, you're not able to use them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it's kind of it's kind of neat, you know, just like because I would they wouldn't necessarily tell like if I if I. If I had dug deeper, I could have gotten more more answers. But really, all I needed to know is like what stories not to not to use. Um, so I just like to extend, sort of like extrapolate beyond a little bit more, and and use some of the you know some of the mythologies, like because these are the stories that I liked when I was when I was a kid. So yeah, I'm seeing that we've only got about 13 minutes left, and we're only about halfway through the fan questions. Oh my oh, goodness! Boy. Really? Yeah, there's. I've got about I think it's about 10 or 11. If it's okay with you, I don't know if you can extend it by half an hour. I don't know if you I, can. I, I've really got to get. I have to unfortunately get back to work. But if you could pick out some of the the yeah most exciting or interesting ones, okay, we could try to we could try to do a little bit more rapid fire. I can try to I can try to be be more concise. <laughs> see how many okay. we can get through. Let's see how many we can get through. There is one in here that I'm going to completely miss because it's asking who from Team Auburn died. So, nope, you're going to have to read the book to see that. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's one in here from Nia that's asking about if Emerald is going to go to the other side rather than the Salem side. Unfortunately, EC Myers isn't part of that uh, story right. team, Nia. So, sorry, that question is going to be getting missed out alongside the Will Crow go back to his old habits now that Clover's died. Unfortunately, right. again, same. Uh... Uh, Nolan asks, do you take any inspiration for fights from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure with the system that relies on strategy and outwitting your opponents over power? 
Um, no, I don't think I've seen. I feel like I saw a JoJo's, a JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Is that like a pretty long running series? Because I feel like I saw some yeah, of it like a it, long time ago, but I haven't seen anything recent of it. Yeah, the yeah the anime started a few years ago. The the manga has been going on since the eighties. I think I've, I feel like I saw like an OVA or a movie or something in like the nineties. Um, cause yeah, I, I, I think you know, yeah, that's different. I think it's different from what everyone else is talking about. So I don't, I don't really know anything about JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. <laughs> All right, but that's cool. I have to, I have to try to watch some of that. It's something to put on your bucket list. Uh... Well, you know, but I can say that I think that that sort of fighting, uh, if if it's as they described it, like that makes sense for for a book. You know. Um, yeah. Where I'm at, I'm at a little bit of a detriment trying to describe action in a really compelling way. Um, versus like the really amazing choreographed stuff that they did on the on the show like that fight with neo at the end was, was fantastic <laughs> and that whole sequence with arthur and and uh and uh I'm I'm amazing you know so yeah um you know so i think that because it's a novel you can be a little bit more introspective and and kind of take a different approach with some of the some of the uh the scenes yeah uh next we've got two questions from jamie sapphire we've seen Team Sun and Team Coffee. Any plans to include some of Ruby or Juniper's actions as flashbacks or memories the team think back on? Uh, well, it's too late for Before the Dawn since the book is coming out next week. Um, <laughs> so there's definitely not any in there. I did not need to uh, do any. So I was I was was encouraged. I guess it was it was almost a, it was kind of a requirement to have some some percentage of the book. Uh, be Ruby flashbacks uh, at least for after the fall, and that wasn't a requirement in the next book, probably, possibly because we were. It didn't make sense necessarily, but it's also because we were we were bringing in Sun. Um, so uh, and and in terms of those flashbacks, like it, there's a lot going on in the book. Like if you've if so you've read it, so there's there are some flashbacks, but those are the more the character background flashbacks. Um, the C team Sun, like we saw a lot of them, at least Sun and Neptune in the show proper and so and seeing them interacting with uh you know ruby and and, and and juniper so you don't really need well yeah so you don't really need um to do that as 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 much um it was really the those flashbacks were really my um artistic way of making making sense of making it doing coming up with a good way i guess or a sensible way to show ruby in a book that takes place where you know parallel to what ruby's doing you know yeah so um i didn't necessarily have that uh that uh ch creative challenge in this in this book huh. um, but yeah you know i mean maybe if there's another book and it makes sense like you know we could i could consider doing that uh jammy's second question was uh do you have any plans for original characters created by the fans no, I haven't read any original characters created by the fans, and I, um, I haven't sought them out, and I would specifically try to avoid them. I think because I don't want to be influenced by by anything, or even like open myself up to to people thinking that I was influenced by by that. Um, so no. No. no, I mean, if if they wanted to do another book and they wanted to have another contest kind of thing, where it's like have your team be in the next Ruby novel. Yeah, okay. I I would do that, but um otherwise like I'm pretty much I pretty much only have drawn on uh things that are on the show or that I've gotten directly from uh Rooster Teeth. Okay. Uh where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Right. Invincible Weasel has two questions. So I'm going to quickly break these ones down because the first question he asks is related to Coco's original semblance idea and he's asking what the original intention was for her original semblance idea before hype i can't tell you there we go <laughs> i figured that would be the answer but i threw that one in yeah. there uh the second question he's asking is many characters in the ruby series are known to have fairy tale illusions were you given the illusions for team coffee as well as other characters if so what are those illusions uh i mean those illusions were i think pretty much established um at least for coffee right and and i guess I guess for Sun, um, well, not. I guess I didn't know Sages necessarily, um, or at least how it how it influences his character. Um, I mostly, I think, I basically went with whatever had been 
previously established. Um, you know, I had the most freedom in terms of like their weapons and 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 um, in some cases their semblances. So for Velvet, you know, I was able to go into uh, uh, Pandora and, and call her um, Camera Anesidora. Um, and then just thinking about, you know, the characters and kind of like what they might try to get into their heads and think what they might call their weapons. But those those illusions were already established uh, before I... Ah, there is a third question on here. I completely missed that from Invincible Weasel. What inspired the ideas for Coffee's semblances? Um, it was kind of an organic thing with... Uh, so, so Velvets obviously was already created... And I think it was it was it evolved from the story, um, like Yatsu's. I'm trying to think. Of, some of it was thinking about like what would be a really cool semblance and something that hasn't been done on the show before, um, and then part of it became sort of the, the, thematic. Um, you know, it, it made sense. Okay, if one of your characters is dealing with uh, dementia, then it would be interesting to have a character who. Can make people forget things, right? Right. And that kind of then started to tie in thematically with Yatsu and his and his flashbacks, thinking about. So originally, the flashback with Yatsu was with his grandfather um, and making him forget something, and so that would have tied more closely with um, with Edward. But then my brilliant editor Chloe um, suggested that we we change it a little bit, and so we were able to keep the sense of it. But we still had the moment with his grandfather telling him, you know. Um, kind of influencing how he uses his, his abilities. Um, and then Foxes, Foxes came about, again, sort of a creative challenge. It's okay, we've never, I, I, he's blind. Um, and we've also sure. never heard him speak. And so then I started to think about, and I didn't want his semblance to be anything that would um, counteract the blindness. Like I didn't want it to be a magical solution to him being blind. Like that's a, a cop out and that's not, that's not um, realistic and that's not, that's not cool, you know, to 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 do that. Um, it's cheap, you know, yeah. and, and it's easy. So I didn't want it to be anything related to that um, specifically. Um, but then, because he was silent, I started. That probably prompted me to think, well, maybe he can he can speak, but he's just we never heard him speak because he's telepathic. Um, and then that, of course, spun into a lot of really interesting possibilities for the plot, um, and also for the team to develop. And um, you know, so there's like that scene where, uh, you know, the, the the one scene where you see the team fighting in the show, and it looks like he's kind of he can see the grim, but he's sort of like the way that he does it, it sort of looks like he's scanning, you know, yeah, in his head. And so I kind of extrapolate, like basically, I take anything I can from the show and extrapolate on that. And it's like, okay, well, maybe he can sort of sense their their auras a little bit. And then I came up, I think later on in the process, I came up with the idea of Ada, his um, his uh, accessibility dialogue assistant on his scroll. And, uh, you know, he has, like, earplugs and things that can give him more information. And that felt really good to me. That felt right to me. That feels realistic. That feels like something that people can do now, you know, for the most part. Um, so I felt really, I thought I was really excited to be able to do that. So uh, that's kind of how that kind of, that's kind of spun out. And then Coco's, um, I had, again, my original semblance for her. I had an idea, and it was a really cool idea. And they're like, oh, you can't use that because it's going to be in the show. Um, yeah. so, so then that, that one, they actually gave it to me. Cause I was like, then what, <laughs> give me something like, what, what do you think would be a really cool semblance? And so they suggested the, um, augmenting the, the dust. Um, and that worked, that made sense to me as well, because it, it reinforces what we see on the show where, um, you know, when you see them fighting in, um, the episode title, um, battle of not battle of beacon. Was the, breach. the breach the breach the breach um yeah. you know they're very she very easily is able to cut down you know massive grim and then later on she's fighting and she's not quite as effective and it's some of that could be seen as okay maybe they're nerfing their powers right because she's so op but a part of it is also like she's out of dust <laughs> like she can't you can't aug augment something you don't have so yeah. um so that that worked for me too because and then that introduces other interesting character um like si situation scenarios in the in the story to deal with um, yeah, you know, so and I think that hype they came up with the name hype as well. Um, uh, that's totally Coco, right? That's perfect for her character. She's all about yeah. hype. So, so that all worked out really well. So that one they had they had more influence with, um, and and, and you know, thankfully. But it, I was I was really, uh, I wish I could have done the the thing. <laughs> I wish I could have yeah. done the, 
I wish I could have done my original idea, and one day I'll reveal what that was. Right. Yeah. So I'm just going to quick fire some questions on because we do yeah. have we got five left. That's all we've got. <laughs> it's funny that. So. Okay. Alexander asks if Vale is Remnant Zero, um, Atlas is North America, Mistral is Asia, Menagerie is Australia. How do you imagine Vacuo, South America or Africa? I think I was leaning more towards like African deserts. Um, I mean, it's it's definitely sort of an amalgamation of a lot of different de like real you know I've researched actual deserts, but then there's also just like the the sort of the cultural aesthetic of something like like Tatooine. You know things like that. Um, yeah, those are some of the visuals that the team had in mind for Vacuo, but they hadn't yet developed it, and so they kind of pointed me. They're like, "Oh, go watch these documentaries, and you know, you know, come up with something." And so I, I watched these documentaries. and came up with a bunch of things in terms of um, how the storms work and um, how structures form. Like the one thing that one of the things that they gave me was like the shifting sands. That like the sands, the sands change uh, quite a bit, which is really interesting. Um, so yeah. a lot of it's based on like sort of like real world earth deserts um right. with like a little bit of fantasy there's obviously some dune in there as well you know so um mm. yeah but i would probably say it's it's definitely more like a just sort of a vast expanse of desert okay yeah uh, our next one comes you know now that i think about it isn't isn't oz surrounded by a desert I the, think the land of Oz. I believe the land of Oz is surrounded by a desert as well. So that's kind of an interesting uh, parallel. It's an interesting. Yeah. Uh, next one comes yeah. from. I don't believe this is the real Barbara Dunkelman, but Barbara, <laughs> but I'd be very surprised. <laughs> how does it feel being the star of the show? Oh, hang on. Yeah. How does it feel being the star of the show? And underneath it, it's got I'm. Sa Xander Harris, and I hope we will see each other sometime, Amigo. Stay fresh, my friend, and good luck. So it's not the real Barbara Dunkelman. Shame. Yeah. <laughs> but how does it feel being the star of the show? <laughs> being the star? Who's the star of the show? I'm not the star of the show. <laughs> 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 yep. Uh, right. We got a bunch of questions from Rust <laughs> from uh, Captain Rusty. Rusty, I told you this in DMs, I believe, but I can't ask all of these questions because he might not know. But I'll get the some of the quick ones out of the way. Uh, is Will Scarlettina a reference to Will Scarlet from Robin Hood? Um, I did not have that in mind uh, when I chose his name. I probably, honestly, I probably took the name Will from uh, The Subtle Knife. Ah. Uh. Uh, I'm going to pick this one out because this one seems to be the juicy one because everything else is covered in the book. He can read the book in his own time. But <laughs> <laughs> yes, go read the book. I do yeah. have I do have one more question after this from one guy that I missed out. Uh, last stream you mentioned you have Carmine's weapons name in mind. Can we get a confirmation on that? If not, then he's got some ideas for the names with Carmine, Carmine's size being named Fang or Venom and Bertilax Mace being called the Crusade. How do you feel on those names? Because he's asking I if they can be official. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't remember. You know, I, I haven't I don't believe I even canonized it in the in the in the book or anything like that. But I think I would I would probably steal from uh, the Hobbit and call them like Sting. OK. Huh. That's an interesting one. Uh, right. Just, I'm going to say this. Two more and we're done. That's it. Uh, okay. Sander, yeah. Sander the Gold in, uh, has asked, in After the Fall, should we assume the presence of livestock in the crowd as the nomads of Feldspar left Feldspar, or did they leave herds of goats behind when they were forced to abandon their empty tanked vehicles? Um, I don't believe, I don't think of any, I didn't think anything about livestock. I think, uh, did they, they mentioned that they had some, like, I don't remember if they had mentioned they had like any pack animals or anything like that. Ah, but yeah, I don't, so like livestock isn't a, I think thing. they probably, I think they probably, they may have left them because they were fleeing for their lives. Um, it's not like they were do doing like an orderly, like nomadic move, like they normally would. They were trying to leave in the midst of chaos, you know? So, and anything that would slow them down would probably not be uh -oh. helpful. Okay, and the last question. I don't know if you saw it in your Twitter DMs. I did send you two pictures, and these were from yes. a friend of Rusty's who was asking what you think of them on being based on Bertalak. Are they close to how you pictured him in After the Fall and Before the Dawn? He's got kind of a more of like a mohawk 
doesn't he? As I've described him. He's a big guy. He's got, you know, he's got the green hair. He's got the green, green armor. Um, he just sort of like, I just imagine him as being very, very, you know, thuggish. Um, but they looked cool. Like I love seeing people's interpretations of the of the characters. And and hey, until until and unless he's in uh, Amity Arena, uh, there's no like pre-established uh, uh, artwork for him. Artwork for him, yeah. Right. Yeah. Those are cool though. I love seeing I love seeing those interpretations. <laughs> we actually made it through the list. As I said, Rusty, awesome. if you're watching this, Rusty, some of the questions you did put down. Just go read the book because they're obvious answers. We can't cover some of them because they're spoiler related. Some of the other questions were relating to stuff that's happening in the show that's to do with Kruby and sadly Easy Myers. I don't think is privy to anything in the show's uh, timeline and making. I think he's only, if I'm correct, you're only privy to the stuff that you get for your book. I, I, I know a few things, but nothing I can share. I can share. <laughs> <laughs> which, is a, which is a shame, but in all honesty, we survived. We got through the before the launch. Yeah. <laughs> and I honestly want to say thank you to EC Myers for coming on for a second time and for coming on a bit longer this time. It's like so many questions to cover and so much to talk about. Before the Dawn does come out next week. So if you haven't pre-ordered it or if you're waiting for it to come out, go buy it because this book is a roller coaster ride. I think you, Eugene will honestly say it's worth looking into and getting yeah. deep into it but yeah i think so and honestly if you know if i can say so if if folks are interested in a third book like this one you know before they decide to do another book they'll definitely be looking at the sales and so hopefully this will do well and first week sales are hugely important to any book because those sales count towards um like the bestseller lists and things like that so if you can pick it up if you're planning to pick it up try to pick it up next week it could, if if we made the list, if we made a bestseller list, then we would have a really good argument for doing a third book for sure. Ooh, and yeah. I would very much like to do another book. So, and I'm hoping you do get to do another book and Fairy Tales yep. of Remnant as well. That's coming out in September. That's going to be another must-have for the Ruby community and Ruby fans. So, so, so once again, thank you for coming on, Easy Mice. Hopefully, we can get you on again for a third podcast down the line. I know you're going to have a busy. I know you're going to have a busy schedule for the rest of the year, from the sounds of it. So, which yeah. thank you for having me on, and you, you know how to reach me. I appreciate the opportunity, and it's always fun chatting with you guys. So, thank you. Thank you yeah. very much, and thank you thank to you guys that have sent in the questions at home yes, who are watching thank you this. For all the good questions. <laughs> and as I say, enjoy before the dawn, guys. I will be breaking that down at some point next week, so look forward to that. And until the next video, guys, have a great day. All right, take care. Thank you. Bye. Uh...